Welcome back to Simple Truth. You know, the problem with uh, working on counterculture with Pastor Mark is, you know, that we're on this whole welcome back to counterculture thing, and he's trying to mimic me, and uh, I don't think it's mockery yet, but he's trying to mimic me, and so now I'm trying to think, oh, maybe we should take things differently, and I pause. There's this dramatic pause as I'm trying to figure out what I should do, and it just always is welcome back to Simple Truth. So, Simple Truth, uh, listen. We literally just spent the last three weeks reviewing that which we did the previous two weeks. Um, and that's on purpose. Like that, That's the way that I think, and I am not the end all of all things, but that's the way I think things should be. God moves us ahead a little bit, and then what do we do? We review the lesson. We review, like, hey, hey, did you get it? Did you get it? Did you get it? This Christian life thing is super hard. I have failed tremendous amounts of times. And big, bigly failed humongously failed and all kinds of things, right? And God says, Amy, you, you got to be willing to review and you got to be willing to pay attention. You got to be willing to know, right? All of us want success. All of us want the favor that God has for us. We want all of the things that God has for us, right? Sometimes we're willing to do what we need to do in order to get the things of God. And God actually gives us. And we go through seasons where, man, it looks like everything we touch, everything we do is just golden. Right? Again, I think it's funny because in the secular world, you know, we promote those people really, really quickly. They're the smartest, greatest people in the world. Right? But almost always those people run into a roadblock a moment in time where it just all of a sudden stops. Because it's never just about you. Right? God's favor falls on the just and the unjust. You're just using God's gifts, God's talents for whatever you want to use them for. So you can look at it and tell everybody how successful you were, how great you were. Man, you were really, really good at your job. You should probably send God a thank you note. That's why even at the Oscars, the Grammys, and all these other places, for years they got it. You would see, literally see people who are singing the most ungodly music ever get up and say, I'd like to thank God for, for giving me the ability to do this. They were smart enough to do it. Right now, not so much. Back then, like, everybody was like, I'd like to thank God for giving me my gifts and my talents. You're just using them the way you want to use them. But every once in a while, God knits us together and, and, and gives us all the things we need, and we do it for him. And that's what David's doing. And the success is great in leading God's people. Now, again, here's the deal. David's leading God's people. You're called as a Christian to lead God's people. You're called to lead other people. You might. You might. If the stats are right, 80% of the people in your church you're leading aren't probably saved. And so you're leading ungodly people. Right? But you're called to lead godly people. So you're to do it differently. We're to do it God's way. The only way you can lead God's people is to be knitted together with God. The Old Testament's full of examples of people who try to do it their way, their power, their resources, their stuff, whatever. And they're not leading God's people. They're just taking a walk. God's not going anywhere where they're going. You want God to go with you. Do you want God to be in front of you? You want God to move with you? Then you got to do it God's way. Moses was smart enough. So when we get in the middle of this, right, we get the success. We get the favor. Good things are happening. Right? I love it. Always when people teach a lesson. I listen to them. They teach a lesson. They teach Sunday school, church, whatever they do. They teach this great lesson. They're like, oh, it was great. We debrief. We're like, oh, man, there was so much truth in that. It was so fantastic. And then you say to them at the end of it, listen, the minute you walk out this door, the enemy's going to attack you, right? Look at verse 6. It says this, as they were coming home, as they were coming home. Do you know home's supposed to be a safe place? Home's supposed to be the place where people love you and they care about you and they think about you and they and they got wrap their arms. Do you know what happens when you go outside of the home and you have great success? Sometimes you come home and, and what you're going to face is the enemy. You, you know, sometimes your spouse, you've had a great evening, you've had a great day at work, you've had a great moment here, we're great, all over, and you come home and you walk through the door and your spouse starts in right away. Seemingly could care less that you just had a great God moment. 
You just had a great day at work. You just had all that. They just start in and they attack on you. Your kids start in and they attack on you. Texts start coming in. Phone calls used to happen, but that doesn't happen anymore. Emails come in. Messages come in. All of a sudden, everything on Instachatgram is fantastic, right? It's just, it's all about what a terrible, rotten person you are, right? I mean, all of a sudden, people are just, how, how did that happen, right? Because you were coming home from success and the enemy knows, where can I attack you best? I'll attack you best at home white because your defenses come down. You don't need your sword. You don't need your spear. You don't need your bow. You don't need your, you don't need any of that stuff at home. Do you know you need all that stuff at home? You know you should come home ready for that? You should come to your small group ready that you might actually need the weapons that God has given you in those moments. You should go to church on Sunday mornings expecting that you may actually need to have the armor of God on. Do you know most people don't put on the armor of God to go to church because why would we need it? And then guess what happens at church? The enemy's all over. He's all over. Why? You don't need any armor there. You don't need when you're home. Right? So they come home. When David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities. All the cities. Isn't it great? Because we've been on this whole all thing. Every city, the women came out. Where are the men? Right, right, right. The men are fighting. So the women came out to greet and cheer on the men. I could stop right here and I could preach this because we really stink at this in Christianity. When's the last time that people came out to celebrate and cheer on people who were coming back from, vi from victories over the enemy? When's the last time you lined anybody's street and you cheered them on? No, you're not going to cheer them on because what if they're wrong? What, 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 if, they, what if they did so? What, what if you cheer them on and then you find out that they did something wrong in the battle? What, what, if, they, what if they failed the next battle? Isn't it funny? We, we love this about football and other sports, man. We cheer, 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 cheer when our team wins. We don't care what they did throughout the course of the week. We don't care who they are. We don't care about anything about them. We just want the victory. And by the way, that was how Jesus felt. People didn't really care anything about him. They were just cheering on for the victory as he was going to the cross, right? But a few days later, what happens? Oh, what happens in sports when all of a sudden we lose a game? People are lying in the streets again, only this time yelling, crucify him. Crucify, crucify, crucify him. Spoiler alert, definitely coming to a sermon near you uh, this Sunday, right? It is unreal, unreal what we do in this whole avenue of, of cheering on people and lack of cheering on people and how we destroy people. One minute they're the greatest thing in the world, and the next minute they're not. Do you know what happens there? This comes because we're so busy watching somebody else's moment in life. We're not paying attention to what the enemy is going to do in that same moment through us. Right? If you really love somebody, pay attention to their moment in life and what they need. And understand how the enemy could use you in that moment. Are you encouraging people? Are you destroying people with your words? Are you constantly reminding them they could have done better? Even in their success, you could have done better. Are you constantly reminding them in their failure? You could have been better. Right? What are you doing when people are coming home? What are you doing when people are coming home from victory? Notice, here's what happens, right? The women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing. Right, right there, just blew the mind of half the people, right? Listening, like, wow, they're singing and they're dancing. Bunch of women dancing. Do you, you think they were dancing, you know, little pirouettes and little, little you know, ballerina stuff and, and you know, nice little dance? Or you think they were dancing crazily? Oh, right, God doesn't tell us. He didn't tell us because it's actually irrelevant. But they're out there dancing probably with all their might, singing. Why are they happy? Because their husbands are coming home. Because their sons are coming home. And they're excited that somebody made it through the battle. Are you, are you excited when people are coming home from battle? Or are you kind of wishing maybe they didn't come home from battle? Are there some people that you wish didn't come home from battle? Or maybe if we would have lost this one, it wouldn't have been such a bad deal. Man, you better check yourself on that, right? To meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated. Saul has struck down his thousands, David his ten thousands. Well, 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 what happens 
when the people underneath you get a little more credit than you do for what's going on. Can, can we just be like real for a second? When, when you're at school because your child is getting an award at school and, and, and you're standing there and you're super proud, proud of them and all this, who actually did all the work? The kid did the work. Right now, you encouraged and you did all the stuff behind the scenes. You did everything. But, but you're not the end all in that moment. The kid is. But how many parents live like they're the end all? Like they, they did it. Right? Again, what happens, what happens when your boss takes all the credit for what you did? But what happens when you're the boss and you know you didn't do everything? You didn't do anything. You just put your stamp of approval on it. This person is the one who's in charge, right? Do you know what happens? Whenever you promote somebody else, you take the chance of lowering yourself. That sounds like a biblical concept. You want to serve other people? You got to be the least. You know the problem in, in our, our culture today? You promote somebody else, you're probably going to lose your job. You get out there and you tell somebody that you can't live without this person or this person's done great, they've done all the work, they've done all the things, then what's the need for you? You go to church, you tell you, listen, man, this person teaches, great. This person does this thing well. This person doesn't, that's a problem, right? What if you let somebody else cook at the potluck? What if you let somebody else run Bible school? What if you let somebody else involved in youth? Somebody who can talk just a little bit better, what happens if, if kids are drawn to new life? People are drawn to new things, right? Here's the result. All of this is good. They're coming home. They're victorious. Everything's going well. And look what happens. Verse 8. Underline it if you have it in your Bible. Because it says this. And Saul was very angry. And this saying displeased him. We're winning a bunch of battles. We're successful for the Lord. People are celebrating. Things are going well. God's blessing. God's giving favor. And the king, the king is what? Very angry and displeased. Why? Because it wasn't all about him. Who's supposed to get the glory? God. Does it matter who, who does it? If God gets the glory, if the kingdom gets expanded, if God... No, but it does in our world does in our world here is the seed of jealousy right here i told you underline this verse because this is the verse that begins the downfall of saul this is where saul and god become unknitted right where saul and david become unknitted where saul and his son jonathan become unnitified this is the verse this made him angry. So I want you to do some homework for me. Simple truth. Are you looking at things that are going on around you where God's getting the glory, good things are happening, favor is happening and all this stuff and you're finding yourself very angry and displeased that good things are happening for somebody. Displeased that somebody said, hey, this was good. Displeased that somebody might say, this is the best thing ever. If you're finding yourself angry, frustrated, and displeased, then the seeds of bitterness have been sown. And guaranteed, here's where you're going with that. Well, they're just not a godly person. Oh, this isn't really a godly thing. Oh, this is, you're going to find fault. If you got to work hard to find fault in things, you're off track, not them. God isn't going to spend all of his time giving you fault with other people, especially when you're in that mode. If your reaction is angry at the things of God, what God is doing, man, that's a problem with you. Now, is there righteous anger? Yes. Are there people who are doing wrong things, wrong reason, all these things? Yeah, yeah. But but when when this stuff is happening, when God is giving somebody else success and you find yourself angry, yeah, you're probably off track. So check yourself, right? You find yourself being angry. Ask God, what's the deal with this whole thing, right? Because righteous anger, 
has you caring about the lost person that you're deeming lost, and you want to do whatever it takes to help that person. Right? Earthly anger, it has you wanting to destroy a person. We'll see you next time. Simple truth.